This model of a DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, helps us to contemplate the complexity and simplicity of molecular biology. The double-stranded helical DNA molecule acts as a chemical blueprint for the structure and metabolism of cells. Segments of the DNA instructions coded by the organism's genes can be copied or transcribed. Just like this blueprint for these sailboats can be photocopied and smaller segments sent to different manufacturers. The DNA copies are chemically encoded strands of RNA which direct the sequence of amino acids in protein synthesis. The new proteins are involved in the expression of the thousands of specific traits which we see as the organism's phenotype, like eye, hair, and skin color. Every somatic cell of an organism has an exact copy of the deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA strands that codes for the genotype of that organism. It looks like this. In another program, you saw DNA replicate and form identical daughter strands ready to separate during cell division. In this program, you'll see DNA uncoil at one segment or gene. Each segment or gene is used as a template for the transcription of a strand of RNA or ribonucleic acid. Models will be used to simulate the transcription process. You'll also learn about Beetle and Tatum's work on DNA and protein synthesis. And finally, you'll discover the many roles that messenger ribonucleic acid, or mRNA, play in the cell. I remember that DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, made up of double-stranded linked nucleotides. But what is RNA? RNA is made up of linked nucleotides also, Corey. But they have a different sugar. Ribose instead of deoxyribose. Hence the name ribonucleic acid. Now, here's a model of a nucleotide of DNA with the base guanine. The phosphate is attached to one end of the sugar and the nitrogen base to the opposite end. Now, look what happens when I replace the deoxyribose with the ribose. Now, I have made an RNA nucleotide with the base guanine. I see. Phosphate is the same, and the nitrogen base part, which makes it guanine, is the same in both molecules. Right. Now, here's a model of a DNA molecule. The double-stranded molecule is twisted into a helical shape. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. Now, it would be good for you people to notice some of the similarities and differences between RNA and DNA as we go through the process of transcription. But first, let's start with a review of DNA replication. The template mechanism of DNA replication proposed by Watson and Crick involves specific base pairing. Adenine pairs with thymine, and cytosine pairs with guanine. The two strands separate and serve as the template for new complementary nucleotide bases. And several enzymes are involved in catalyzing this semi-conservative model of replication. Oh, that's well done, Corey. Now, Bibi, what's the result of this process? Well, replication gives the cell two identical DNA strands. The genetic material is now ready to be passed on to the next generation. So we need an exact copy or there will be an error in the message. What if there is a mistake? Uh, the flow of genetic information from the genetic material must be accurate. If it isn't, a mistake may ultimately show up as an error in cell structure or function. This can result in a genetic disease. However, not all mutations are harmful. Some are actually beneficial to the organism, and some have no effect whatsoever. So what is the role of RNA? RNA is involved in the synthesis of proteins, a very important function. And here's how it works. The code for a specific protein is in the DNA molecule. This code is transcribed to a molecule of RNA. This molecule is called messenger RNA because it takes the message from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, where, with the help of two other molecules, 
ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA, the protein is actually synthesized. Here's how transcription works. Instructions are sent to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm to synthesize a specific protein, say to repair a damaged part of a cell membrane. The two strands of DNA uncoil like this. An enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches itself to a portion of one strand called the promoter or initiator sequence. This is where transcription begins. RNA nucleotides are present in the nucleoplasm. They differ from the DNA nucleotides by having a ribosugar instead of a deoxyribosugar. The RNA sequence of nucleotides are guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil. Uracil? I was expecting thymine. I see you've remembered your base pairs from DNA. Thymine does pair up with adenine in DNA, but thymine is not found in RNA. RNA has a chemically similar base uracil as one of its nitrogenous bases. Okay, so instead of thymine, RNA has uracil. Uracil pairs with adenine. So do guanine and cytosine still pair up? Yes. So let's see. Your sequence of DNA bases, AGT, TAC, CGA, would code for RNA bases. U for uracil goes with A, adenine. C for cytosine, go with G, guanine. A with T, A with T, U with A, G with C, G with C, C with G, and U with A. So why aren't they staying linked? As the nucleotides pair up with the bases along the DNA strand, the RNA enzyme polymerase links them to each other and separates them from the strand. That way, they're linked in the right order. Now the enzyme reaches a termination code, which indicates the transcription process is over. The new RNA strand, messenger RNA, or mRNA, leaves the nucleus. The DNA reforms using the original hydrogen bonds with the nucleotides on the opposite strand. That's pretty amazing. There are three key principles in molecular biology that explain DNA and gene expression in an organism. First, the synthesis of DNA occurs during DNA replication. Second, DNA does not act directly, but codes for the synthesis of RNA, ribonucleic acid molecules, in a process called transcription. Third, the decoding of RNA messages occurs during protein synthesis, where the messenger RNA nucleotide sequence is translated into a protein. Thus DNA regulates cell activity and specifies an organism's phenotype by directing the synthesis of proteins. How did researchers make the connection between DNA and proteins? Well, that was done by studying simple organisms, like the bread mold. But before we look at the history of the research, let's review the structure and function of proteins and enzymes. Proteins are the building blocks of life. These structures are made up of amino acids. The amino group, NH2, is characteristic of all amino acids. The other elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, are also found in all other organic compounds. There are 20 different amino acids. Condensation reactions, which result in the loss of a water molecule, occur between the amino group of one amino acid and the acid group of another amino acid. This results in the formation of a peptide bond. When three or more amino acids are bound in this way, they are referred to as a polypeptide chain. All proteins consist of polypeptides. Some proteins play a role in initiating or speeding up chemical reactions in an organism. This catalytic role defines the protein as an enzyme. So, all enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. The structural components of your cell membranes, hair and fingernails, are made up of proteins. Hormones such as insulin are also specialized proteins. 
So this bread mold has structural proteins made up of polypeptide chains and enzymes made up of different specialized polypeptide chains. Right. Now let's look at the research that led to our current understanding about the relationships between DNA and proteins. George Beadle and Edward Tatum did their groundbreaking work in the 1940s. They had been studying the metabolic pathways in a bread mold called Neurospora crassa. Given a nutrient-rich medium, the Neurospora can synthesize everything it needs. Beadle and Tatum hypothesized that if genes produce the enzymes necessary for metabolic processes, then a mutation in a gene should alter the enzymes and make those metabolic processes impossible. With this in mind, Beadle and Tatum irradiated the fungal organisms with x-rays and then observed the effects. They found that if all the necessary amino acids were in the nutrient medium, the molds grew normally. If some were missing, some of the organisms could not produce the necessary amino acids, while other irradiated mutants could. Further studies showed that different mutants were blocked at different points along the metabolic pathway. The block came about because the enzyme needed to catalyze that step wasn't being produced in the mutant, so one gene seemed to be related to the production of each enzyme. The one gene, one enzyme hypothesis was uh, developed uh, several years ago with classical uh, uh, genetic tools in Neurospora. And we now know that uh, the concept is correct, it's just that we have to put it into context of what we know about uh, the molecular biology of genetics today. If we take a whole chromosome, and this is one of a homologous pair, and we take in the center of that, there's one strand of DNA, and, and if we were to enlarge this small section, and we'll call that location a gene, if we take that section of DNA, we all know that there's the double helix, which is a double-stranded molecule. This is our DNA molecule, uh, and it's that single gene. What we know is that the dogma that was developed indicates that that molecule serves as a template for a messenger RNA molecule that is a mirror image of one of the strands. And in fact, it is synthesized uh, complementary to the base pair analysis of one of those strands. And this messenger RNA molecule then goes out into the cytoplasm of a cell and is the directions are read like a computer program uh, by what we call ribosomes in the cell. And the directions of this messenger RNA molecule are, are actually read in such a way that we end up with a peptide. And a peptide, when it becomes mature, will get some secondary and tertiary structure so that it ends up as a molecule that in gross terms we call a protein. So, in fact, we have a single gene that ends up with a single enzyme or a single protein. But we now know what the processing is. And as a result of the work on reverse transcriptase that earned David Baltimore and Howard Tenman a Nobel Prize, we now know that the dogma says that this arrow has to go backwards because certain retroviruses, their genetic material is RNA, and in fact they go into a cell and make a, a DNA molecule which is then subsequently uh, reversed uh, back. Gene defects, as we know them, go right back to this double helix. And in a double helix, we have a certain base pairing that occurs between the two strands. And when an accident happens, as it happens on a regular basis, we have a replacement. We call a mutation. Now, most mutations that occur uh, due to ionizing radiation, to, to uh, uh, other types of chemical reactions or exposure to ultraviolet, a whole range or chemical carcinogens, those mutations are repaired in your cell. However, some of them are not. And those that are incorporated into your germline and passed on to your children are, are the basis of genetic disease. And that simply means that there's some altered base sequence in the steps of the DNA ladder are changed in such a way that the molecule may function in a different way or it may not function at all.
What gene therapy essentially is, is the introduction of foreign genetic material into some cells of the body. An example would be that you put in a gene that produces a protein that the individual is, in, is deficient in. In diabetes, you would be putting in the gene for insulin. Gene therapy could be used to treat AIDS by making immune system cells resistant to HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Gene therapy could also be used to enable the patient's cells to destroy the infected cells by increasing the body's immune response to these elements. Gene therapy raises several ethical issues. Certain groups oppose procedures which artificially change or manipulate the inherited makeup of an organism. Are you ready to compare DNA and RNA? Ready. You can use this chart if you wish. Okay, then. Cory, you can start dictating. Okay, under DNA, the sugar, we have deoxyribose as part of their nucleotides. And for RNA, we have ribose sugar. Good, and next to the strands, put double helix for DNA. And RNA is a single strand, so put single. Will the RNA be coiled too? Good question, BB. RNA is a single-stranded molecule, so it doesn't have a helical structure. However, sometimes it can coil on itself. What's next? Size. Well, DNA is relatively large compared to RNA, which can be a single-stranded replica of just one small part of DNA. So I would put small. And next is sight. DNA is found in the nucleus. And RNA is made in the nucleus, then goes to the cytoplasm and the ribosome. But what do you mean by type? For our purposes, DNA is DNA. But you know that there are three different types of RNA. Right. Messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. Right. And the three of those work together to ensure that the proper protein is synthesized in the cells. But isn't there another difference in the nitrogenous bases? Uh, good observation, Corey. The DNA has guanine pairing with cytosine and adenine pairing with thymine. And in RNA, guanine is still paired with cytosine, but adenine is now paired with uracil. That's a good comparison, gang. I think we've hit all the major differences here. Now, do you have any questions? Yes. How does the messenger RNA know where to start coding from the DNA molecule? There are specific sequences of nucleotides in the DNA molecule. Sequences of nucleotides which signal the start of transcription are called promoters. Promoters tell the RNA polymerase where to initiate the transcription process. Other nucleotide sequences called terminators signal the end of transcription. After mRNA leaves the nucleus, it travels to a ribosome which is made up of rRNA, or ribosomal RNA, and other proteins. Protein synthesis will occur with the help of tRNA, or transfer RNA. The tRNA works with mRNA to ensure the proper sequence of amino acids in the formation of a protein. You'll see that process in the next program messenger RNA seems to have a key role to play in determining the regulation of gene expression. What have you learned about messenger RNA in your research? Well, we're learning that messenger RNA actually has many functions in addition to coding for the protein. For example, different parts of the RNA are now known to contain information that localizes the RNA within the cell and also controls where and when it can be translated and can also be involved in the control of the RNA turnover, so how fast the RNA is cleared from the cell. And these are all located in sections of the RNA that don't code for the protein and were originally thought to be very boring parts of the RNA molecule. Now we know that they're very interesting. What is the significance of these findings? 
Well, that means that once we understand enough about how RNA is regulated in terms of when it's translated, where it's translated, and how quickly it's cleared from the cytoplasm, we then might be able to exploit this knowledge to develop new kinds of genetic therapies for many kinds of diseases. If mRNA is not just a strand of codons to be translated into proteins, should we give it a new name? I don't think so. I think messenger RNA is pretty entrenched in, in the historical linguistics of uh, molecular biology. But I do think that people like Christiane Nusslein Volhart, who won the Nobel Prize last year for part of the work she did on messenger RNA, she has really brought to people's attention that RNA is a very interesting molecule and it has lots of different functions associated with it. Let's see if we can use these models to simulate the process of transcription. The genetic information from this DNA will be transcribed to form a messenger RNA molecule. Here's how it works. Maybe you can help me with this. Just like the initial stages of DNA duplication, the DNA molecule will uncoil and then separate. Now an enzyme, RNA polymerase, will attach itself to a promoter sequence on the DNA molecule and initiate the process of transcription. Complementary RNA nucleotides are floating around in the nucleoplasm of the cells. Enzymes will place these nucleotides according to the leading strand of the DNA. The RNA nucleotides will form temporary hydrogen bonds with the DNA nucleotides based on the pairings, cytosine with guanine and adenine with yersin. Yes, Good. And that's because we're forming RNA. RNA. Right. Which is being coded for from DNA. DNA. Good. Now the enzyme RNA polymerase will link these nucleotides to form a single linear sequence. Now, the synthesis of messenger RNA is initiated by enzymes and transcribed from the DNA molecule. It is processed into a single strand of nucleic acid by the enzyme RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase continues transcribing until it reaches a terminator sequence. The terminator sequence signals the RNA polymerase to stop transcribing and to release the messenger RNA molecule then the DNA molecule reforms. You mentioned that mRNA plays a role in cell growth and programmed cell death. Could you expand on that a little bit? Well, in terms of cell growth, we know that messenger RNA can code for proteins involved in cell growth, so that's the traditional way of, of viewing messenger RNA function. We also know now that there are functions in RNA, like control of the turnover of RNA, that can be very important in control of cell growth. Because if the RNA codes for a particular protein that has a critical role in cell growth, when that RNA is there in a very long time in the cell, you have a lot more of this protein around. And so there are RNA functions that are very important for control of cell growth. Could some cancers exist because of errors in mRNA? Certainly. Uh, a lot of tumors have a translocation of a gene called CMYK, and a translocation is a, a swap of CMYK with parts of another gene. And a lot of these translocations result in CMYK RNA that hangs around in the cell for far too long a time. In normal, in normal cells, CMYK RNA is turned over very rapidly, but it's very much stabilized in tumor cells. And we don't know how this, this really works, which, and this is a very important new area for cancer research. It's now known that exceptions to the rule of transcription do exist. Certain RNA viruses, called retroviruses, can produce DNA by reverse transcription they can also replicate their RNA molecules. Human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, is one example. How do RNA viruses infect the cells? Uh, here is a good diagram. Now, uh, of course, there are many RNA viruses, and they all have different uh, replication strategies. This is a retrovirus, such as HIV. The virus needs to get inside the cell in order to replicate. The first step would be interaction of the virus with the cellular receptor. After interaction, 
with this other receptor, there is a fusion event that takes place between the virus envelope and the host cell plasma membrane. Okay? The result of uh, this event is the release of the capsid, of the virus capsid, into the cytoplasm of the cell. And of course, you can see that this is a genome of the uh, virus. After that, the reverse transcriptase is activated, giving rise to an RNA-DNA hybrid. Okay. Subsequently, you have a double-stranded DNA structure that is circularized and is integrated into the host cell chromosome like that. Now, so as the cell divides, of course, you can see that the DNA, that the virus DNA, uh, uh, also divides. And then we have a transcription event, meaning that the DNA is transcribed into RNA. And there's only one kind of RNA, but they serve two functions. They can serve as messenger RNA. In this case, proteins would be made, or they can serve as genomic RNA. Okay. Now, the genomic RNA is then encapsidated by these proteins, giving rise to a capsid structure containing the genomic RNA. Two strands of, geno uh, of genomic RNA is encapsidated per capsid. And of course, the final event would be the budding event, where you have the capsid enveloped by the virus envelope. The envelope of the virus, as you can see, is derived from the host cell. So here you have a, essentially a complete cycle. Messenger RNA is a fascinating molecule, but it's only part of the story, isn't it? That's right. The molecular basis of heredity, from genotype to phenotypic expression, involves the three stages shown here. DNA replication, transcription, and translation. And that whole process requires enzymes and many other proteins. Right. So this part of the story is equally important. Exactly. Many different parts have been assembled from a blueprint to create this fully functional sailboat. The same is true in living organisms. Only when each constituent part of the whole is complete can there be full expression of the genetic code. In this program, you have considered the second principle of molecular biology, transcription, or getting the message out, whereby an RNA copy of a DNA code is constructed and sent out of the nucleus to the ribosomes. Translating the nucleotide code into the language of amino acids or protein synthesis forms the basis for the next part of the great molecular biology story.